This time, while browsing through site of the day winners on awards, I was on the hunt for a standout carousel as it's been a while since we tackled any cool slider. That's when I came across this site that won site of the day on February 20th this year and right on the homepage, you are greeted with this striking infinite scroll slider. The moment I saw it, it instantly caught my attention and you can probably see why. You can see as you scroll down, the container distorts outward, creating this bumpy warped transition between slides, scroll up and the distortion flips direction. What's even more impressive is that along with all this, when you stop scrolling, it intelligently snaps to the nearest slide. We haven't built anything quite like this before, so I decided to give it a shot using 3JS. And as you can see here, I managed to pull off a very similar version, complete with the distortion in both directions and that smooth snapping behavior. In this video, I'll walk you through how to build this kind of scroll powered experience using 3JS and custom shaders. We'll use a simple plane geometry and apply shader based texture for the distortion effect. On top of that, we'll also implement snapping logic so the slider always settles on the most visible slide, updates the project title and even links to a different URL, which you can easily extend for routing or adding custom project pages. If you want me to cover more cool 3JS projects like this, please leave a like on the video and subscribe as well. If you'd like to access the source code, you can check out the pro membership via the link in the description. I've also shared a Next.js version of this project with the pro members. Alright, let's dive into the code. Let's begin by setting up the basic HTML structure. To avoid the page looking empty, I'm adding a simple navbar. I'll split it into two sections, one for the logo and one for the navigation links. Both sections will have placeholder links for now, the logo on the left and links like about contact and some social links as well on the right, just to balance the layout visually. Below that, I'm also adding a footer with some dummy text. None of these elements are essential for the slider functionality, but I'm including them to better match the overall aesthetic of the original website. Next, I'll add an empty div with the class gradient background. We'll use this later to create a soft gradient background using CSS. Now comes the key part, the container where we'll render our slider. Inside it, I'm placing a project title container which wraps a clickable link. This link will span the entire slider area, so later you can easily hook it up for routing or navigation if needed. Inside that link, there is a masked div that we'll use to animate and reveal the project titles. And the title itself will be just a simple paragraph element. That's all we need for the HTML structure. The actual image slides will be created using 3JS. Alright, let's move on to the CSS and start styling it. I'll start by importing the Roboto Mono font from Google Fonts. Then, I'm resetting the default styles using a universal selector. We'll remove all margin and padding and set box sizing to border box for consistent sizing across all elements. For basic typography, I'm styling both anchor tags and paragraph elements. They are set to display block, text uppercase, and we remove underlines by setting text decoration to none. I also set the font to Roboto Mono, size it down to 12 pixels and apply a lighter font weight. Next, let's style the nav and footer sections. They are both absolutely positioned, stretch to full width and pad it slightly for breathing space. We use display flex with justify content space between and a small gap to space out the items. The nav sticks to the top and the footer to the bottom. Both have a higher Z index, so they stay above everything else. Inside the navigation, we have two groups, links and socials. Both are laid out with flexbox and spaced out using some gap. We also ensure the nav items distribute evenly using flex set to 1 on both direct children of nav and on the anchor tags inside links. Now for the background, this div is placed at the bottom of the page and stretches across the full viewport. We give it a subtle linear gradient that fades from light gray to white mimicking the clean fade seen on the reference site. It sits behind everything else with a lower Z index. Next up is the container. We make it relative, give it full width and height of the screen and hide any overflow. We also bump the Z index to 2 so it sits above the gradient. Inside the container, we have the project title container which is centrally positioned using a fixed position in a translate transform. We give it a 50% width and 16 by 9 aspect ratio which is exactly same as the slider we'll be creating next. Then comes the project link which fills up the entire container and is flexed aligned to center its content. It also removes the underline and sets the text color to white. Inside that, we have the project title mask which is where the title animation happens. 
we use a clip path to restrict visibility to a narrow strip and apply overflow hidden which allows us to animate the text in and out smoothly later. And finally, the project title itself, it's position relative, centered and starts with no vertical offset. It will have the same Roboto Mono font, center it and set the text to uppercase. The key here is the transform and transition which will animate later when the slide changes. That's all for this styling. With this in place, we now have the perfect structure and visuals ready for our 3 j slider to kick in. Now before we jump into the JavaScript part, let me quickly show you how we'll set up the content for our slides. I've created a separate file called slides.js to keep things organized. This file simply exports an array of slide objects, each one containing a title, a link and the image path. We'll import this into our main script and use it to control everything from image textures to titles and links. I've also created a separate file called shaders.js where we define two custom shaders, a vertex shader and a fragment shader, which together drive the distortion and texture transition effects. I'll be honest, I don't have any experience in writing shaders from scratch, so I described what I needed to chat GPT and got this shader code generated for this project. In the vertex shader, we manipulate the plane's geometry using sign functions that react to the scroll intensity. It slightly bends the plane along both the horizontal and vertical axes, creating that nice ripple or distortion effect you saw during scrolling. The fragment shader is where we handle the image blending. We pass in both the current and next textures, and based on the scroll position and each fragment's vertical coordinate, it decides which texture to display either the current one or the next. The simple logic gives us that fluid, scroll-responsive slide transition. Both shaders are then used inside a shader material which will apply to our plane geometry in the main JavaScript file to bring everything to life. Alright, let's finally start working on the JavaScript that powers the 3.js slider. First, we import everything we need. We bring in the 3 library which gives us access to all the WebGL magic like scenes, cameras, geometry and rendering. Then we import our custom vertex and fragment shaders from the shaders file we created earlier. And finally, we import the array of slide data from the slides.js file. That's where all our image paths, titles and links live. Next, we grab a few elements from the HTML. We select the container where our 3JS canvas will be rendered. And we also grab the elements for the project title and link. These will update dynamically based on which slide is currently visible. After that, we set up some scroll related variables. We are using two pairs of values, one pair to track scroll intensity which we'll use for the distortion effect and another to track the actual position for the slider that is which slide we are currently looking at. We also define how smooth the scroll transitions should feel using these scroll smoothness values. Then we add a few helper flags, his moving will tell us when the user is scrolling, his snapping helps control whether we are snapping to the nearest slide and his table keeps track of whether the slider has finished moving or settled on a slide. We also keep track of which slides should be shown right now and which one is next using stable current index and stable next index. Lastly, we define some state flags for the title animations so we can smoothly hide and reveal project titles when the slide changes. And right after all that setup, we initialize the text content of the title and the link using the very first slide from our array. This makes sure the page loads with the correct content from the start. Now let's move on to setting up the code 3.js scene. This is where all the visual magic is going to happen. We start by creating a new scene. Think of this as our canvas. It's where all the 3D objects, lights and effects will be added. Next, we create a perspective camera. We give it a 75 degree field of view, which is good middle ground for most scenes. The aspect ratio is set to match the current browser window and we define a near and far clipping plane so the camera only renders things between those distances. We then move the camera slightly away from the center by setting its Z position to 5, giving it room to view our upcoming plane. Next, we set up the renderer. We turn on anti-aliasing for smoother edges and make sure the canvas fills the screen with the set size function. To support high DPI displays like retina screens, we set the pixel ratio but cap it to 2 for performance. Then we make the background transparent by setting the clear color to white with 0 alpha. Finally, we attach the renderer's canvas to the container in our HTML so everything shows up on the page. Next, we need to figure out how big our image plane should be on the screen. So I've created a helper function called Calculate Plane Dimensions. It takes the camera's field of view and uses a bit of math to calculate how big the visible area is.
Then we scale it down using a width factor 0.9 for smaller screens and 0.5 for larger screens. The height is automatically calculated based on 16 by 9 aspect ratio, which keeps things consistent across all devices. We store the result in a dimensions object, which we'll use when creating the plane geometry. Next, we move on to textures. These are the images that will be displayed in our slider. We create a new function called load textures that loops through every slide in our data array. It loads each image using texture loader and applies some basic filtering to keep the images looking clean and smooth. If any image fails to load, we log a fallback message in the console which would be helpful for debugging in case if you want to customize it later. We then call preload all textures function which marks each texture as updated and ready to use. This helps prevent any visual glitches or delays when rendering them for the first time. So at this point, we have our scene, our camera, our renderer, and all the slide textures loaded and ready to go. Now let's move on to creating this plane. This is the actual surface where our slides images will be rendered. We start by creating a plane geometry using the dimensions we calculated earlier. We also pass in a resolution of 32 by 32 segments. This adds a bit more detail to the mesh, which allows our shader distortion to bend and ripple the plane more smoothly. Next, we set up the material using shader material. Here we plug in our custom vertex shader and fragment shader that we added earlier. We also set the side to double side. You can ignore this one, but I added it when I was trying to play around some animations. Then we define our uniforms. These are dynamic variables that the shaders will have access to. We pass in scroll intensity, which controls the level of distortion based on how fast or hard the user scrolls. Scroll position, which tracks the scroll offset between slides and the two textures, current texture and the next texture, which hold the images being transitioned. Once the geometry and material are ready, we combine them into a mesh and add that mesh to our 3JS scene. Now to make our transition smooth and accurate, we need to figure out which two slides we are currently between at any given scroll position. So we define a helper function called determine texture indices. It takes in a scroll position and calculates which two images we should be transitioning between. First, we get the base index by flooring the scroll position. This gives us the current image. We also normalize negative values to wrap around properly in case the user scrolls backward. Then we calculate the next index by adding one and using the modulo operator to make sure we stay within the bounds of our slides array. We also calculate the decimal part of the scroll, called normalized position, which tells us how far the transition has progressed between two slides. Then we define another function called update texture indices function. This one updates the actual uniforms in the shader. If the slider is in a stable state, meaning it's not scrolling, we lock in the stable indices. Otherwise, we dynamically calculate which textures to show based on the current scroll position using the function we just wrote. This ensures that the current pair of images is always shown on the plane and that the shaders get the right input to animate the transition. Now let's handle what happens when the user stops scrolling. We'll start with the snap to nearest image function. This function makes sure that when scrolling slows down and comes to a stop, the slider automatically snaps to the closest light. We first check if we are already in the middle of snapping, if not, we trigger it. We round the current scroll position to the nearest whole number, which gives us the closest slide index. Then we set that as our target scroll position, so the slider smoothly settles there. Using our earlier determined texture indices function, we update the stable indices for the current and next textures. We also update the current project index, so we know which title and link to show. And finally, we call the show title function, which brings back the slide's title with a smooth animation. Speaking of the title animations, let's look at the height title and show title functions. When the user starts scrolling, we call the height title function to move the title slightly down and fade it out. We do this using a CSS transform and a small timeout to create a smooth transition. We also use a couple of flags, title hidden and title animating, to make sure we don't accidentally run this animation multiple times. Once scrolling stops and we have snapped to a new slide, show title function does the opposite. It sets the new title and URL from our slides array and moves the title back into view with another smooth transition. This way, the title always stays in sync with the visible slide and the motion feels fluid.
Lastly, we handle responsiveness with the resize event. If the window size changes, we update the camera aspect ratio and projection matrix to match the new dimensions. Then we resize the renderer and recalculate the plane's width and height using our calculate plane dimensions function. We also dispose of the old plane geometry and create a new one with the updated dimensions. So it always looks perfect no matter the screen size. Alright, now it's time to bring our slider to life. First, we add a will event listener to the window. Every time the user scrolls, the function gets triggered. We also prevent the default scroll behavior to keep things fully controlled by 3JS. Then we set his snapping and his stable flags to false because we are now in motion. We right away hide the title so it fades out as the user begins scrolling. Next, we update the target scroll intensity based on how much the user scrolled, the delta y value. This intensity value controls how distorted the plane becomes during the scroll. We also clamp it between a max and mean range so things don't go out of control. Then we update the target scroll position which represents how far we have scrolled between slides. Setting his moving flag to true tells the animation loop that a scroll interaction is in progress. Now let's jump into the animate function. This is our rendering loop and it runs every single frame. We start by calling request animation frame to keep the loop going smoothly. Inside the loop, we ease the scroll intensity toward its target using a linear interpolation. This gives the distortion a smooth ramp up and cool down instead of instantly snapping in and out. We update the shader's scroll intensity uniform with this value which directly drives the distortion effect on the plane. Next, we do the same for the scroll position. We gradually ease scroll position toward the target scroll position using another smoothing factor. We normalize the scroll position to keep it between 0 and 1. This helps us handle the wrap around between slides cleanly. If the slider is in a stable state, meaning it's snapped and idle, we set the shader scroll position to 0. Otherwise, we feed in the normalized value so the fragment shader knows how much to blend between the current and next textures. We then call update texture indices function to make sure the correct images are being displayed based on the current scroll position. After that, we apply dynamic scale to the plane. This adds a bit of zoom in and out effect based on how hard the user is scrolling. Just a subtle touch but it adds a lot of depth just like the original website. To ease things out, we decay the target scroll intensity gradually so the distortion effect naturally fades once the scrolling ends. Then we check how close the scroll position is to its target. If it's really close, we trigger the snapping logic to lock the slider onto the nearest whole slide. We also check whether we have completely stopped. If so, we mark the state as stable and fully settle the scroll position. Finally, we render everything using the render method which draws the scene and camera to the canvas. And of course, we wrap the entire loop in the animate function which keeps everything running smoothly frame by frame. So that was it. Hope you found the video helpful. See you in the next one.